that be Hillary recording? So what I'd like to do is um, try and share with you a few lessons that we've learned with regard to leadership, the various projects that we've run. Um, as I say, I don't have a career. Uh, what I have is a series of daft ideas. So I'll come up with an idea, get all passionate about it, and then try and take it from that inception through to conclusion. So today, I think it's 27 projects that we've run, most of them in sailing, but been up to the North Pole a few times, just done a historical project. In fact, this year, Canoe Kayak around Tasmania. So, what I'd like to do is try and draw the lessons that we've learned and weave them through the tapestry of two stories. So, the first one I'll talk about is a single handed round the world job race, and the second project is this project that became known as Team Phillips. Does anybody remember Team Phillips? Big blue cat around with two silver masts. Well, one of my claims of fame is that is I lost the world's biggest catamaran. <laughs> it should be embarrassing, but I'm actually really proud of it. So I'll try and um, wander through those and share the lessons that we've learned. But before I do that, I'd just like to touch on what we would see leadership within our teams as. And I think the first thing I would say is that the best teams that I've ever worked in are teams where every individual within that team is a leader in their own right. So what we're striving for is a group of leaders and we would see leadership as a state of mind, perhaps, an ethos uh, that runs right across the team. So we would say that leadership challenges the norm, whereas management makes it more efficient. And I think each is as important as the other, but they are quite different. And you can have too much of either. If you have a team suffering from too much leadership, what you'll come across actually is a group of really quite frustrated people. Because every time they go to work in the morning, they just know that there's going to be another right idea on the table that will sweep them off their feet. And they won't even have a chance to think about the last idea. Other end of the spectrum, teams suffering from too much management. You may have come across it. You'll find a group of people who've um, slowly crawled so far up themselves that they're in a very dark place. They have no sense of direction, no sense of responsibility or drive. And if you take those two extremes, we always felt there's a relationship between the two. You visualize it like a pendulum swinging backwards and forwards. So if you swing up to a leadership phase, you challenge the norm. It's very exciting. It's creative. But what of course it does in turn is generates chaos. And I think you then need to consciously swing back to the management phase, get all your processes and infrastructure sorted out, try and provide a solid platform from which the team can then swing back up to another leadership phase. And we've always found that if you start a team or perhaps join a team, you need to decide in your mind's eye where that pendulum should lie and then act accordingly. Does that make sense? Because if you take that principle, I think the next question to ask yourself, if you have the privilege of leading a team, is what are you truly trying to achieve when you go to work in the morning? And the way I would see it, what you're trying to do is you're trying to do yourself out of a job. And what I would mean by that is if I was perhaps skippering a fully crewed yacht around the world, uh, and of course this is a collective process, everybody in that boat is involved in it, but as a skipper you've achieved your role such that you've collectively reached this moment in time that should you fall over the side, and be lost at sea, there should be no day-to-day -day effect of the performance of that vessel. So what you're doing is you're continually training, you're delegating, you're coaching, you're bringing people on, slowly extricating yourself from all those nitty-gritty day-to-day decisions. And of course the reality is, is you're not doing yourself out of a job. What you're doing is you're managing that pendulum, freeing yourself up for the next strategic step. Does that make sense? we can all go now, that's basically it. <laughs> but I do like to start with that, uh, uh, just to give this general principle that we use within our teams. Now, before I go into the project, I'd also like to touch on risk, because I think if you're challenging the norm, then there is risk involved, and you need to be clear with regard to your relationship to it. And as an adventurer from the outside, we're um, quite often perceived as these nutters who just go and throw our lives on the line. But actually, if you look inside the project, we have a very different relationship. And an easy analogy to use would be if you threw down a challenge to go from the top of a mountain to the bottom of a push bike, then a risk taker would grab the first bike that they could find and throw themselves down that mountain to fate. Whereas what we would do, and I do underline that word we, it's a team effort, is we'd quietly go away, do a lot of research, find the best bike possible, and then we would do a trial run, you know, a quarter of the way, halfway, find that perhaps we need to develop better brakes, or wheels, whatever it might be, but it wouldn't be until we'd gone through that process that we would choose to leave the top of the mountain. Very much on our terms now, 
absolutely confident that we should fire our strip in evil can evil time. We would know that um, having got to the bottom of the mountain, we should have created this new area of innovation and technology for the benefit of others in the future. And I guess I would also leave with this quiet sense of inner confidence, because what we have done is often unseen from outside the project, but deep in the bottom of it, we have woven this safety net whose duty is to preclude the ultimate sacrifice, which in the case of some of these projects, of course, is loss of life. So what I would say is we don't take risk, but we embrace risk, which is a hugely different relationship. We'll spend a lot of time articulating the risks that we face. We'll ring fence an area outside which we're not prepared to step, and then police it really quite diligently. So I do think you need to think about this relationship. Now, the other thing that we found uh, with our projects is that um, a, a successful team is often described as lucky. And you may have come across this, it feels quite unfair at times. Uh, but I think if you, if you see it as unfair, the other side of the coin is true to it. If you drill into a successful team, what you'll find often is a, is a group of people, sometimes an individual, who have been prepared to make their own luck. And for me, that's the defining difference. Now, this is a group who are either prepared to put their nose to the grindstone and create an opportunity, or sometimes simply have the courage to grab it as it comes past. And my lucky break with regard to ocean sailing came along when I was in the Royal Marines. And uh, unbeknown to me, the Royal Navy had these 10 sail training yachts, which were all tired and old. They needed to replace them, so they put them on the market, managed to sell nine of them, but they couldn't get rid of the, the last one, this tired old boat. So eventually, out of frustration, they decided to donate this to the Royal Marines. And, and that was my first lucky break. Second thing, and it really was a book of circumstance, this boat fell under the responsibility of my commanding officer. Uh, he couldn't say, he didn't know what to do with this thing, but he really felt he ought to do something. So the telephone rang one day, which I, I picked up with some trepidation. I was always in trouble. Uh, and it was the commanding officer. Um, Marie Goss, would you care to do the two-handed transatlantic race, which kind of wasn't a request under those circumstances. <laughs> but um, the obvious answer was yes. There's no way I was going to miss this opportunity. And he finished the conversation by saying, um, uh, you do know what you're doing, don't you? <laughs> so I was thinking in the back of my mind, I don't know what he was saying. I crossed the English Channel a few times, didn't know anything about ocean navigation, but I had all winter to read up a book. So on that basis, I assured him that he had nothing to worry about. <laughs> Life, of course, being what it is, we then got called away on a difficult operation, which took all of our energy up until just before the start. So if you can imagine, Chris Johnson, my partner and I, we find ourselves in Plymouth, races from Plymouth to Newport, Rhode Island, which is quite close to New York. There's all of the flags and the bunting and the resonant has, in the middle of which is Chris and herself shuffling around, feeling really quite sheepish because we didn't know how to find the finish. So it was quite embarrassing, actually. Anyway, we, we decided that um, all we ought to do is get down to the basics. So we went down to the pub. Uh, we, we had a couple of beers and eventually came to the conclusion, and this of course is worst case scenario, but um, ultimately, provided we keep following the sunsets, then you know, we would be bound to hit America because of course it's big enough. Uh, and having hit America, we could ask a fisherman whether to turn left or right. And, and so these projects began. And I do think one of the funny things about life is there's a thousand reasons on the shelf why you can't, you won't, you shouldn't. There's always an expert that will tell you that you can't do it. The other side of that, of course, is that you can try. We accept that we might be 20% off the pace of the finish, but of course it's not until you get to the finish that you can identify that 20% and then start to polish it for longer term performance. So we always take quite a long term view with regard to what we're doing now as a team. Life is a tough old road, it is full of potholes. If you give some space, you can start to look back at some of them and actually you're really quite grateful. Anyway, start gunway, off we sail, no problems with boat speed. And from recollection, I think it was about the third day out, we stumbled across our solution to ocean navigation. And this was the realization of the aircraft flying between Heathrow and New York. What they do, of course, is they follow the Great Circle route. Net result is this great big corridor of vapor trails. So what we, um, what we did was we basically followed the white lines. <laughs> and it was very successful. I still use them as a reference now. You can see them at night. That got us all the way across the Atlantic to the Grand Banks of Newfoundland, where it then gets foggy and overcast. And what we then did is we fell, fell back on Concord, which used to fly past morning and evening. So if it boomed to the right, we would tack up, and if it boomed to the left,
that we would touch down. And that was our first ocean trip. Interestingly, we came second in class, 24 hours within the standing record. But what it really served as, looking back at it with a little bit more wisdom, is this amazing apprenticeship. We learned so much on that first voyage. It was quite a hard trip. Halfway across the Atlantic, we had a very bad storm. And um, this poor old boat started to break up. We lost all the power. The fuel began to come off. Uh, we started to sink. I mean, we found that anything up to a force three, the helmsman could see with one hand and continually pump with the other one, and you could just keep on top of the water in rest. Anything above a force three, which of course is the majority of the time, the other one would be down below the bucket, bailing into the cockpit. Fifteen days we did that, uh, 24 hours a day, and, and the whole thing became really quite tedious. Uh, and the only break from this routine was when the water level rose so high that the toilet bowl became submerged. Uh, and we found that you could sit on the toilet, pump like buggery, and achieve the same thing. So this was a highlight on our trip. <laughs> Mainly because you could uh, read a book at the same time. <laughs> anyway, we crossed the finish line, um, lifted the boat out in the car park, desperate to see what was wrong with it in the car park, uh, and the keel fell off. So there we were with the keel at our feet. Now, looking back at that voyage, with a little bit of wisdom, we're very conscious that the mistakes we made on that trip has since turned into cornerstones of success. And one of the things that we're very clear with our regard in our teams is our relationship to mistakes. We're always saying, look, don't, don't cry over the mistakes, but celebrating the lessons. And we don't suffer fools gladly. You know, clearly you should only ever make a mistake once. But I think if you take that view, the next thing that's really important within the team is trust. And I mean absolute trust. This is 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We have a saying that all of the dirty washing stays on board. There is no way any member of the team would dream of going down to the pub, having a couple of beers, and starting to chit chat behind other people's backs. We don't do politics, we don't tolerate politics. Now, one of the things about trust is that it takes time. And the reason it takes time is it has to come from the leadership team, and it has to come by example. Once you have it, it's a hugely powerful thing because suddenly people feel able to share their mistakes. And the moment you stop tucking them under the carpet, of course, is the moment that you start to create the car. Stop reinventing things. Just start moving and learning as you go forward. And, you know, some of these things I'm going to touch on are pretty simple as we move forward with our teams, but we found them to be quite profound in terms of their effect. Now, the other thing that happened on that trip, and I can clearly remember, 2.31 morning, bailing the boat out, is it suddenly struck me that um, I'd stumbled across what I wanted to do in life, this was to go ocean sailing and made a commitment to do a single-handed round-the-world yacht race. And it actually took 10 years of effort from that moment of commitment to get this wonderful boat at Corcoran to the start of the French event. It's known as the Vendée Globe, non-stop, single-handed round-the-world with no outside assistance allowed. So, you know, if you're given a bottle of water, then you're out of that race. 10 years to get there. A lot of people miss this. The sailing is obviously the icing on the cake. But we enjoy the cake as well. I mean, I've never sailed single-handed, didn't know about design, construction, publicity, business. All of these things had to be put in place. That foundation was required before we could even consider taking on the race itself. So the race is pretty simple. We're starting in the northern part of Europe, down the Atlantic, left at Cape Town, rattled across the bottom, left at Cape Horn, and of course back up to the finish. Now the main focus is this bottom leg. The reason for that is that it takes you into this area that's um, known as the Southern Ocean, and it represents a necklace of very deep depressions which keep circling the globe. And if you look at the chart, by freak of nature, there's no landmass to inhibit the waves. And that results as a big swell builds up, anything up to 30, 40 feet high. That goes round and round the world unchecked, which in turn generates quite a strong current, actually. And I know you've got to four knots at times. So as a sailor, on the one hand, you have this fantastic resource of energy that you can tap into, whereas on the other hand, it gets quite hostile. As you go deep south, sea temperature drops to minus one, the wind chill on deck can drop to minus 30, then of course you've got icebergs dotted around. So this is very much a war, not a battle, in the sense that to win, first you have to finish. The race we undertook was the third time that it had been run, and statistically we knew that only 50% of the fleet would finish. So this is a real focus. The interesting thing though is before the start gun goes, I've done this race 40 or 50 times, it's in color, I can taste it, I can smell it, it's a bit like a stage in my mind. And every time we go around that imaginary world, everybody in the team can throw any conceivable problem 
or indeed solution onto that stage, and we'll quietly wrestle it through to conclusion. What happens over a period of time is you end up with a very, very clear vision of what you're doing, why you're doing it, what people, resources, back up. Everything that's required is actually put in place. And for us, we would say that 70% of the result is put in place before you even start to build the boat. It's a hugely important thing. Uh, and it kind of ties in, you know, the more that the team is involved, the richer the vision will be. The more are allowed to be involved, the more likely they to take responsibility for it. Uh, and for us, it's important. If you go back to leadership and describe it as challenging the norm, then the only route map that you have is your vision. And the clearer your vision is, the less likely you are to get lost. So we spent a lot of time on this period. Now, before we take on a project, it has to stand on four legs. Innovation, technology, challenge, and adventure. And I've got this picture up to try and share with you perhaps the spirit of the boat we were looking to create. What we wanted was a 50-foot surfboard, something that could have some fun on this fantastic wave. So to give you a sense of the boat, 50 feet long, 15 feet wide, and yet the hole was only three feet high. A little blister in the middle so that you can stand up in front of the chart table. We're using the latest aerospace materials. Just to give you a sense of that, before we put any fittings on this, and remember it's a 50-foot yacht, six of us could pick it up. Just the most amazing structure. In a funny way, we would see that as part of the management side, though. Any decent team in its DNA should be searching out a kilo here or a kilo there. The real breakthrough for us actually was the keel. I don't know how many of you here sailed, but um, I'm sure you'll have seen a picture of a yacht sailing along as an angle with all the crew on the windward rail. Give it writing moment or power. Well, obviously, you don't have that luxury single handed. So at the time, people were using what we call water ballast, and they had big tanks either side of the boat and they would pump up to five tons of water to replicate the crew. Well, we couldn't see the point of designing this lightweight structure and then shoving five tons of water in it. So what we did was we created a swing keel, and hydraulically we could swing the keel up to windward, which would in turn give us a writing moment or the power of a water ballasted boat, but without the penalty of the weight. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, breathtakingly simple. I couldn't believe it hadn't really been done before. All the experts came out of the woodwork, this is going to be a disaster, the keel's going to fall off. And I'll never forget the morning of the start, I woke up to a headline, Goss will die. And that one helped breakfast down. But, um, the difference was we believed in this and we were prepared to try. Interestingly, that Kukora went on to set and then hold the world 50 foot 24 hour record for nine and a half years. Nine and a half years, nothing to do with me. I hadn't changed the way I said what we had done collectively as a team is we searched out a step change in the way that we would tackle this problem. Now anything that's new is difficult and anything that's difficult requires commitment and all of these projects, particularly this one now, I think if you distilled it down to the core, you'd really end up with two people and that would be Tracy, uh, my wife and I, back to back through thick and thin. We knew it would be difficult to get to the start line so we just said look, We'll do whatever it takes. If that's 18 hours a day, seven days a week, then so be it. And quite humble beginnings. I used to hitch up to London. I'd sleep on Paddington Station with the trams. In the morning, have a wash and a brush up in the public toilet, get my blazer and tie on, and get out knocking on the doors and trying to learn about this thing called business and sponsorship. To some success. I mean, we raised enough money to start building the boat. We got about 60% of the way through construction when we stumbled across this thing called cash flow. <laughs> Which is bloody awful, isn't it? I, mean, I, I, know, I cannot believe how naive we were. And, and it was desperate. The whole thing was falling apart. Until, and in fact, it was Tracy's idea, we decided to sell our family home to keep the project going. Now, for three young children, and that'll perhaps give you a measure of the commitment required to get a boat like this to the start line. But I think the most important point to make on behalf of tracing myself inside the project, is there's just no way we felt we were throwing our home into the winds of a dream. We really believed there was a future for the family in ocean sailing, and this is what we were investing in. And the moment we made that total commitment, it was as if someone had bolted wheels on the project, and it just took off. And I think for me, it really demonstrates that unless you personally are absolutely committed to something, then you can't expect anybody else to be committed with you. If you have the privilege of leading a team, with it for me comes a quiet duty to go for a walk and ask yourself, do I have the commitment required? Because if you don't, 
be honest, put your hand up, change your job, get a quiet one, charge up your batteries before you jump back into the fray. Commitment is a hugely important thing. So we finished the boat, did two transatlantics to try and iron out the wrinkles before we got to the start line. And I'm often asked, how did you feel at the start of this race? And, and I can tell you, I felt nothing but confidence. And that, of course, was thanks to all of that training and preparation. We have a saying in sailing that knowledge dispels fear. The more you train and prepare as an individual and as a team, then the more robust you'll be when the tough times come along. And this is a huge team. This is all about collaboration in all sorts of different areas. Just to give you a couple of examples, when we began the project, we started with a blank sheet, broke it down into its constituent parts, and then we tried to find people who would help us take each one more, one small step further forward, hoping that collectively we would get a stride in terms of performance. So, a couple of examples. Sleep, fascinating subject. We all have a specific sleep pattern. It's a bit like a fingerprint, a bit cheeky. I was on the phone, got into the middle of NASA, found they were investing billions in a sleep deprivation program, put myself forward as a guinea pig, wore a monitor for a year, such that we knew when we were under that race, and you don't get much sleep, I'll get four hours every 24, which is then broken into 20 minute cat naps. Now, if your sleep's that limited, you've got to make sure you get it at the right time. Uh, we knew that we were making the best use of the limited resource right across that fleet. Did a lot of work on food. Uh, I can't remember now, I think it was 3,500 calories a day to keep up the work rate in the tropics. That went up to about 6,000 in the Southern Ocean. Back then, you couldn't get the food we wanted, it was all freeze dried. Mixed it up ourselves. Local butcher at the end of the day's work used to drive past my mum and dad's front door, post the keys to the letterbox. They would then go back and spend the night borrowing his vacuum packing machine. They vacuum packed all the individual meals. Then they vacuum packed 24 hour bags, within which was everything required matches, toilet paper, vitamin tablets. They were numbered from 1 to 120, which is what we felt the race would take. And the calorific content waxed and waned as we knew we would go through the different temperature zones. Uh, the menu was a six-day cycle, so I didn't have the same meal every Sunday. Uh, and um, on the sixth day, Tracy and the kids put a really nice surprise in there, because, you know, we're not just machines. We all have a heart and a soul, and these things need nurturing. And that's something else we try to introduce within our teams. It really is a family. People really do care for each other. I think it's a very important element of, of a good performing team. Um, Stark gun went. Rattled down the Atlantic, not as fast as we'd hoped, if I'm honest. I felt a little bit frustrated. I mean, we were in for the competition, but not seeing what we felt this boat would deliver. And really, all the way down the Atlantic, just checking the numbers, come back to the numbers. The numbers never lie, just polishing and polishing until the Southern Ocean. And that's when it all came together. Uh, and it was fantastic. I cannot tell you how thrilling it was. We're now working our way up through the fleet, we're picking up a world record. Everything felt great. <coughs> until, of all days, Christmas Day. Woke up to this beautiful Christmas morning. Now this is straight out of a Christmas card. Lovely clear sky, beautiful crisp air, light frost on the deck, northerly 20 knot breeze. But what was intimidating was the pressure. The pressure dropped 36 millibars in 24 hours, most of it in the last 12. And it's at times like that, figure on your own, if you're not careful, your imagination can start to run away with itself. You know that there's hurricane force winds on the way, there's nothing that you can do about it. Once you're in the storm, of course, you're up to your ears in mud and bullets, and there isn't much time to think. So this came in very quickly. In only a three-hour period, it went from a northerly 20-knot breeze round to the southwest, 40, 50, 60 knots of wind. I mean, I could only just keep up with the sail changes. And imagine now just the storm chip, size of a domestic door at home, your kitchen door. And things are getting quite hairy now getting boat speed to 28, 30 knots. Uh, it was the slowest I could make the boat go. Now, when you do these big ocean races, there's always one bad storm, and you instinctively know it when you're in it. And once you're in it, you're really quite conscious that provided you can nurse your way through without major damage, then you're going to finish that race. Uh, and this, without question, was the big storm. The problem was the sea state, mainly. We had a residue northerly swell. And very quickly, a vicious southwesterly sea built up. And when the two meet, what happens is you get this um, huge upsurge in water. It is hundreds of thousands of tons. It's very, very unpredictable. It's only happened to me twice in a lifetime of sailing when a storm reaches this critical point, and it does, it tickles up the back of your neck. 
And with it comes the realization that actually what's just happened is you've just lost control. And all you can then do is react and react and just hope that the whole thing holds together. So the boat was knocked down three times. If you can imagine a big breaking wave the size of a three, four story building slamming the boat on its side. Uh, twice it was nearly pitch pole or cartwheeled. I have a very clear memory of being thrown up against the engine to find myself looking out the back of the boat. But actually was looking up at the sky with um, gallons of water pouring down. Thinking over here. <laughs> There's really not a lot you can do when it's like that. I mean, the boat got knocked down again, uh, crawled on deck, did a quick jury repair, starting to get a lot of damage now, stumbled back down below again, basically seemed the safest place to be with these great big waves sweeping the boat. It's actually going dark down below with a volume of water running across it. So if you can imagine, stumbled down to this complete chaos. There's a couple of feet of water slopping all over the boat tools and equipment strewn everywhere. There was food dripping off the deck cable, the ceiling. I always remember the food and wondering how it got there. And stumbled down to this very shrill alarm. I've never heard it before. It was coming from the BT Inmarsat system. If you can imagine email by a satellite, that little laptop on the right, beeping the shrill alarm. So I worked my way across the boat, called up the message to find that it was a mayday. And everybody asked, what did you think? when you've got the May Day. Well, I can tell you, I had a good look. Uh, and I just thought, shit. <laughs> I mean, the timing couldn't have been worse. I found a chart, wiped the water off it, put a position down to find it was a fellow competitor, Raphael Donelli, who, unfortunately for him, was 160 miles away. But even worse, as he was dead upwind in what was now blowing hurricane force conditions. And I'm always asked about this decision to turn around. And I can honestly tell you, it was actually a very easy decision. I don't think it was mine. I think it was laid down many years ago by a tradition of the sea. And that, of course, is that if someone's in trouble, then you help them. And I've been involved in a lot of rescues over my time, but this one was the first one, because of the severity of the storm, where I was actually forced to think about the consequences of the decision. And I remember sitting down, I don't know, mine goes at 100 miles an hour, 30 seconds a minute, and you're forced to think about the important things in a storm like you know, you think about your boat, think about your family, but you have to think about your life itself. And it just seems to me that if you keep chipping away at life, you will eventually come to this very clear and simple crossroads, and that is that you either stand by your morals and principles, or you don't. You know, you get deep in the valley of life. It's actually a very, very simple place to be. And I think for me, the biggest lesson that came out of this was how important your values are as a team, as a company, uh, and everybody in the team is responsible for the values, but if you're one of the leaders, you're also a custodian, and you have a duty to articulate them. So many times I've come across teams that are built on assumptions, and it's really just not good enough. Let's say we were going to race around the world, uh, and, and, you know, I guess you want to win it. Well, one of the first questions I might ask is, should we cheat or not? Because I think that's a legitimate question, and why do you go down that path until the values are very, very clear, Everybody understands them, buys into them, and if any individual can't, then I'm very sorry, but actually you don't have a place within this team. Because when you hit the tough times, the values are all that you have, and if they're not in place, I mean governments collapse, sports teams, but we've all seen it. It's such an important part of leadership. So crawl on deck, and it's absolutely screaming up. Can't hear yourself think with the noise. Quite hard to breathe with the volume of water that was being torn off the surface of the sea. And I turned the boat up to the wind, and with the wind alone, without the waves, that performed just lay flat on her side. I mean, I watched the guardrails go underwater, watched the mast go into the water, crouched in the cockpit, the whole thing is shaking violently. And just thinking, you know, how can we possibly do anything for Raphael in this? And the rescue actually took two days, and you could break it into three very clear parts. The first part was to survive the storm. If we could survive the storm without major damage, only then would we worry about 160 miles, and if we could crawl those back, only then would we worry about trying to find Raphael on the ground. And this is something that we use all the time within our teams. If you're faced with a very big challenge or goal, it's so easy to be overwhelmed by it. Everyone's like a rabbit in the headlines. So we lay a pathway to it with measurable milestones, and we're always saying, look, worry about that which you can influence today. Don't get overwhelmed by unknowns in the future. Plan for them, of course. But keep working in the real world, because that's the world that will buy the team, give it strength and depth, which in turn 
will sustain it through the difficult times that are over the horizon. So that first night was appalling. Boat was being knocked down every 20 minutes. I mean, it's like being in a car crash. Just to give you a sense of the severity of the storm, the boat was shaking so violently that the engine ripped off its mast. So if you can imagine being able to go down to a marina, pick up a yacht, and then shake it until the engine tears off, you'll start to get a sense of this. And it kept rising and rising. Uh, I mean, there just seems to be no ceiling to it. And it reached this moment in time where actually there was not a lot more I could do, becoming quite badly injured, thrown around inside the boat, crawled into a compartment, tied myself to a strong point, and then waited to see what would happen. Now, either the boat would make it, or it would fall apart. Uh, and again, I'm not sure, probably spent about four or five hours tied to the boat. And one thing I would say is, um, don't, don't ever think this was a single-handed race. It was an absolute team effort. And to my mind, that five-hour period tied to the boat was the team's finest hour. These fantastic designers <coughs> and builders, many, many months ago, who had done their job with real pride and diligence, actually was what got that boat through the storm. Rub any success might be on the surface, and you'll quickly reveal the team that's delivered it. And one of the tragedies of life is that simple truth often gets lost in the midst of an ivory tower. You know, you've got to break down these towers and all the rest of it. It's all rubbish. It's the people that make the success. So we're plugging away that 160 miles. Raphael, in the meantime, is in a terrible situation. Gone down a huge wave, boats cartwheeled, trapped inside, wouldn't come up right, pitch dark, water levels rising. Then the mast broke free and this huge great tree trunk started to pile drive up through the deck. Diesel tanks ruptured, he's vomiting with the fumes. He was in there for about five or six hours before the mast went out the side of the boat and it eventually came upright. So he's now in this desperate situation. The boat's completely submerged, big holes all over the deck, crawled on top, clipped himself to a strong point, and then faced this raging southern ocean storm. And he was telling me afterwards, you know, these waves used to sweep the boat, they'd um, drive him on his knees, flat on his face. The really big ones, as he had to grab a big lung full of air as he went into the face of the wave, and just hope that that would sustain him until he came out the other side. I mean, absolutely desperate situation. Clearly, his only chance of survival was his life raft. He inflated the raft, tied it to the boat. Shortly afterwards, this huge squall came screaming through, and it was so strong that it ripped all the tethers out of the raft. And basically, Raphael stood on his deck, all on his own, deep in the southern ocean, and just quietly watched his life just blow away like tumbleweed. I mean, imagine that. He's 1,200 miles from the nearest point of contact. Sea temperature where he is is one degree. Wind chill is minus 25, and he's just lost his life. Chanting to Raph afterwards, as he realized this, fact, he made peace with himself. But the one thing about Raph was he never ever gave up and literally just pushed death before him day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute. And I think for me, it demonstrates that often, sometimes, just courage, determination, and persistence will carry you far, far further than logic might dictate. So he survived on his deck all that afternoon, through the night, into the following morning when the Royal Australian Air Force came up. And what they do is they drop two lifecrafts out the back of the plane with a tether between them, which then drift out to the casualty. He pulled the nearest raft in, tied it to the boat, jumped in, found there was no food or water, so he jumped back on board. Uh, and put his feet through this hole in the deck, managed to grab a little box of food which he chucked into the raft. Uh, with that, another big wave swept the boat, uh, and a bottle of champagne came to the surface. So, uh, a typical Frenchman, you know, in that way, he followed it, uh, untied the raft, scrambled around to make sure everything was okay, before he then stood back up to bid his boat farewell, only to find that it had sunk. It's honestly the most amazing story. I met the pilots a year later, and from the air they saw this little figure clamber into the raft, and then watched the boat just ghost away and fade up underneath it. So you can imagine how Raph felt, sat down with this huge sigh of relief, and the champagne blew, and the cork hit him in the eye. <laughs> he had a big lump in his eye when I picked him up. So anyway, he's trying to survive on his raft. We're plugging away at 